um, Aspen Center for Physics Colloquium. It's been an interesting experiment to do these online. Um, and we're really happy to have uh, Chanda, Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein giving a talk about um, axion physics for the last colloquium. So um, Dr. Prescott Weinstein is an assistant professor of both physics, um, or she's an assistant professor of physics and core faculty in women's and gender studies at the University of New Hampshire. Um, she earned her PhD from the University of Waterloo and Perimeter Institute and has had postdoc appointments at NASA, MIT, and the University of Washington. Um, she's also in the process of writing a book called The Disordered Cosmos, um, which will be out next year, and I highly recommend people to keep an eye out for this. Um, so without further ado, let's um, hear some more about how we can learn about our universe through axioms. Thank you, Tian Tian and Amanda. Can everyone hear me? Can someone just shout out, yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Oh, uh, lots sorry. of people shouting Actually, out. <laughs> maybe before um, maybe before we start, I also wanted to say, can we please hold our questions to the end, um, so we can let Chanda finish the talk. And if you have questions, keep them in mind, but let's keep them for the the end of the colloquium. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, I I would appreciate it if people hold off on questions, just because that's what uh, Aspen has asked us to do. So we'll we'll all try and abide by that. So today I'm going to talk to you all about, as Tian Tian said, uh, she knows my research, I'm going to talk about axions. I gave the title of this talk a little bit of a more general title because really what we're thinking about is understanding the microphysics of dark matter and how that potentially imprints on to large scale structure. Um, so one way to kind of frame what I'm going to be talking about is how we go from the seeds of structure formation. So what you all are looking at here is a Planck telescope um, temperature map of the sky. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So there is some color variation in the image. These variations are really one part in 10 to the 5. So these are very small temperature variations. But importantly, even though they're very small and these are effectively um, uh, the product of quantum fluctuations uh, that happen at the end of inflation, these are the seeds of structure formation. So all of structure in the universe really kind of begins in these um, fluctuations and these over densities and under densities. So in kind of a big picture sense, the questions that I think about are how do we get from this temperature map and these over densities and under densities that are now going to translate into large scale structure on cosmological scales. So this is Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. You can see on the right of this um, plot that um, the redshift is actually, for those of us who are early universe cosmologists, right, this is actually a very low redshift image because this isn't even going out to even a redshift of one, which is where, for example, cosmic acceleration turns on. And what you're looking at here is um, really filamentary structure, so galaxies, galaxy clusters. And so another way of, of putting what I just said is that we're thinking about how do we map from this SDSS data back onto that Planck telescope data? And how do we tell a story about what has happened in between? Um, so another way of thinking about what I do is asking the question of what is the universe made of? So when I was uh, doing my first research experience as an undergraduate in the University of Chicago REU back in summer of 2000, I got to see Rocky Cold give a talk about the state of cosmology, right? And 2000 was a very exciting time because cosmic acceleration had just been announced as a phenomenon. And so Rocky gave this very interesting talk where he said, we're in a very exciting time for cosmology because we've almost figured all of it out. Um, we know that the universe is approximately, um, like I think at the time he said 4% normal matter we know that dark energy is approximately 70 percent uh, and we know that dark matter is approximately 26 like, percent and you know we basically have it all worked out as soon as we know what the heck dark energy and dark matter are then we'll have the whole problem worked out so the good news is that 20 years later 
and these are still open questions, which gives people like me something to do with our time. And I think like the really striking thing that I like to communicate, so I, I aimed this talk at an audience of people who everybody's done an undergraduate degree in physics, but maybe we're all off doing different things. And so I just want to really contextualize things that for the most part, we spend a lot of time thinking about what we call like normal everyday matter. So these are like the people that I have on the slide, like Anthony McLean and Jacob Blake and Brianna Taylor, um, that these, that we are normal matter. Um, but in fact, human beings and like pretty much everything that we see on earth is what's strange about the universe because actually what's normal when we're doing um, the, the mathematics of like what is the universe made of, what's normal is dark matter and um, what we colloquially call dark energy, I will just say whatever it is, the thing that is driving cosmic acceleration. So today's talk I'm gonna focus, is gonna focus primarily on dark matter. And you'll notice that the numbers that are on the slide are, the percentages are a little bit different from the ones that I, I quoted from uh, 20 years ago. And that's because as time has gone on using, for example, the cosmic microwave background radiation and like improved data that we've been able to fine tune what these percentages are. So what is the case for dark matter? Why do we think that there is a, a, a dark matter out there? So um, I think a lot of us will be familiar with the work of Vera Rubin using a spectrograph, spectrograph developed by Kent Ford that effectively looked at the kinematics of stars. And from looking at how much mass we would expect to be in the center of a galaxy, um, based on kinematics versus how much mass we expect to see based on how much the stars were radiating, it turned out that there was a mismatch. And so that's what this plot is showing you here on the right. And so the case for dark matter is that we apparently need more mass than we can see. I think it's important and valuable to note that there are two ways to solve this problem. You can either actually, you know, say that there's more mass or you can modify gravity. Um, so modifying gravity is I think more difficult. It's harder to do something that matches the data, but I do wanna point out that that is a viable area of research that people are actively engaged in. So what's the deal with dark matter? So it produces no light um, as far as we know. So we call it dark matter. And what we really mean is that we can't see it. And it's, we tend to talk about it in terms of its only interaction is through gravity. So we know it's somehow it's gravitating the way that like so-called everyday matter does. So I would like to shift people's thoughts about this a little bit away from only interaction is gravity to its only significant interaction is gravity. We actually hope that dark matter has interactions that are non-gravitational and there are lots of uh, dark matter de direct detection experiments um, like, for example, uh, Sensei, uh, which uh, TNTM works on, um, that people are thinking about um, other ways of detecting dark matter besides looking for gravitational effects. And so we expect that there will be some other interactions. But gravity seems to be the dominant way to look for it. And I just want to point out that it's not actually dark so much as invisible. Light goes right through dark matter for the most part. Um, so you'll see in a little bit that that's kind of a first order statement and not necessarily, um, or a zeroth order statement and not necessarily a higher order statement. But for the most part, light goes through what we call dark matter. And so you could call it invisible matter or clear matter or transparent matter. So if you want to develop an intuition for what, what we're talking about, that, that's, that's a better way of developing intuition. So I'm showing you this rotation curve data, um, but of course we have since the 70s when um, Rubin and Ford first published their papers about this, found other evidence for the presence of dark matter on large scales. So importantly, this is a strong gravitational lensing image from Hubble. I'm sorry I didn't put the, the attribution on the, at the bottom of the slide for, for who took the image. Um, but what we do know is that it's very hard to explain strong gravitational lensing without the presence of large amounts of dark matter. 
So I put, I just had like one note on the slide that I'm dark matter bends light because one of the coolest things about not only having general relativity, but also having dark matter out there um, as kind of a dynamical process is that you do get these like really phenomenal, exciting um, activities where space time is basically acting like a fun house mirror. And so you get these multiple images for example, of galaxies that are basically mirror images that aren't actually real. And it's very, very hard to explain something like this with a modified gravity model. And it um, is much more natural and easy to do if you just assume the presence of dark matter. Um, so what do we know about dark matter? So as I've mentioned, photons don't seem to interact with it very much. Um, particles seem to move slowly. They can't be short-lived, right? We need them to be around for um, structure formation. If you put something like this, this cold dark matter picture that I'm describing to you into um, a simulation, you get um, hierarchical structure formation that looks similar to um, what we actually observe. And for example, that SDSS data. So simulations and data match on large scales. So that is in some ways like very satisfying if you're just thinking about things from the point of view of doing observational astrophysics. Um, but if you are someone who does like particle cosmology and particle theory like me, then one of your questions is, what is it? Um, how do I write down a Lagrangian for it? What are the specific properties? What are the coupling constants? How does it interact with the standard model? Does it fit into the standard model? And so in fact, one of one of the ways that we kind of talk about and think about dark matter is that this is in fact beyond standard model physics. We know that standard model particles cannot account for the, the, the dark matter. For a, a few decades, it was thought that perhaps I'm one of the, that neutrinos might explain what the dark matter was. And I'm, in some sense, you can think of neutrinos as a very small sliver of the dark matter population. That's, I've, I've heard people talk about it in that, in that way. But we now know that neutrinos are not massive enough to explain all of the dark matter that we need in order to explain the observational evidence that we have for its existence. So we are in a beyond standard model physics picture. So this is a very exciting thing for those of us who are theoretical physicists. Um, because this means that we could have lots of ideas and uh, try new things and uh, come up with different theories for what the dark matter can be. So this is the Venn diagram to end all Venn diagrams. You'll see in the bottom left-hand corner, the attribution. This was made by Tim Tate from UC Irvine. I can't take credit for this amazing Venn diagram. So this is um, lots of theories of dark matter, how they overlap, how they intersect, I don't really think that you can find a Venn diagram that's more exciting than this one, to be honest. So you'll see lots of different things happening. On the top of the, in the, in the top half of this Venn diagram, you'll see um, a big bubble that's labeled on the right as supersymmetry. So you'll see that there are lots of different possible models that are inspired by supersymmetry. On the right, you see things that are inspired by extra dimensions and string theory. You'll also see in the, on, the, on the bottom right um, things that are inspired by the Higgs, so models that are inspired by, that look like the Higgs and have similar properties in some ways. On the, the top left, you see self-interacting dark matter um, and also sterile neutrinos. So I always want to make a point of noting for people that sterile neutrinos are not one of the neutrinos that we have observed. So they are a hypothesized particle. And so then in the bottom left corner, you'll see axion-like particles. And this is actually where this bubble is where I spend a lot of my life. And just as a, a little like random um, historical fact, uh, Frank Wilczek named the axion the axion. And I believe it was Steve Weinberg who was originally calling it the Higlet. And I feel like it's kind of a missed opportunity that we call it the Axion instead of the Higlet. Although um, Axion is also a very cool name. Um, I'm just a Winnie the Pooh fan. So what is Axion? What is the Axion? Why should you care? So essentially the Axion is a byproduct of a solution 
to a problem that the standard model has. So we, a term can be added to the QCD Lagrangian, the quantum chromodynamics Lagrangian, that breaks CP symmetry. This is called um, the strong CP problem. So essentially you can add the term that you're seeing on the screen. It has a coupling constant theta, which is highlighted in red. And theta ideally would go to zero. So why would we want theta to go to zero? Because if theta is non-zero, the neutron gains an electric dipole moment, and we have never observed this electric dipole moment. So Roberto Pecci and Helen Quinn came up with a, a resolution to this problem that allows us to relax the theta to zero. And the way that they do this is by upgrading that theta, that coupling constant, to a field. A byproduct of this is a Nambu Goldstone pseudoscalar, the axion. And this axion gains a potential via gluon interactions, and it also has a shift symmetry. Um, so as you can see at the bottom of the slide, the Lagrangian um, takes the following form. For those of you who have maybe seen something about axions in cosmology literature, you might say that's not the Lagrangian that I ever see in the literature. And so I just want to point out that there is this instanton approximation that is widely used in cosmology because the particle has a shift symmetry that the potential for the axion um, gets treated as, as a cosine. And the two scales that are relevant that appear in, in this potential are the quantum chromodynamic scale and also this F, which is the symmetry breaking scale. This is also sometimes called the axion decay constant. So you will see both used interchangeably in the, in the literature. And then for the purposes of a lot of dark matter work, often this cosine is Taylor expanded out to a phi to the four potential. Um, an astute observer might notice there's a minus sign in front of the phi to the four. So if you just look in the bottom right hand corner, that minus is actually inside the little lambda. Um, so we haven't done the Taylor expansion wrong, but this is a common convention to write the Lagrangian this way. Um, so before I, I, I get too far into describing, you know, what, what the axion um, can do for us cosmologically and what its phenomenology is, I'd like to explain some of the terms that you might see pop up in relation to it. So importantly, the strong CP problem is a problem that needs to be solved in the standard model. And it's completely in some sense separate from the dark matter problem. It happens to be a nice thing that the axion doesn't have a mass given a priori. It can be very light. Um, it, it can be stable and slow moving. And so it satisfies all of the qualities that we need dark matter to have. Um, and this was a realization that various people had in the early 80s, not long after Peche and Quinn published their paper. So there are different types of particles that we talk about when we say the word axion. So what I've just been telling you about is the QCD axion. So these are, tend to be um, a cosmological population that were made in the early universe. And by early, I mean like um, during cosmic inflation or right after inflation. Um, they can also be made thermally in stars. So then we also sometimes talk about axion-like particles. So these are particles that also have shift symmetries. These are scalars that have shift symmetries like the axion, but they're not necessarily there to solve the QCD problem, um, strong CP problem. And they are often motivated by string theory. Um, depending on what the mass is, they may or may not solve um, the dark matter problem. Ultralight axions are ALPs that are up to 10 to the minus 33 um, electron volts. So I say up to, but really what I mean as small as. So um, many up to like as in many zeros after your decimal place. And these can have a different phenomenology from your QCD axion at 10 to the minus 5 EV because the size scales involved are going to be very different. Ultralight axions can be the dark matter when the mass is about 10 to the minus 22 EV-ish. Um, and then we, you run into observational constraints. You'll also see the term weakly interacting slim particles. So these are light bosons that are sometimes complex rather than real fields, while the QCD axion is a real field. They're not always scalars. So I just want to point out that if you go into the literature and start reading about these particles, you actually want to have care. 
are they talking about the QCD axion or are they talking about a kind of like DIY, do it yourself, we need a particle that's kind of like the axion, but it's not necessarily the QCD axion um, or something along those lines. So I also wanna point out that you, you, you'll recall that I said like much earlier in the talk that um, the dark matter may have some electromagnetic interactions. It may interact with light. So the axion does have an electromagnetic coupling. It takes the form shown on the screen um, and it's governed by this coupling's constant GA gamma gamma. So this means that there's possible thermal scattering in the early universe. Um, there's also, you'll notice that the mass and um, decay constant of the pion appear here. So um, you could potentially get hot, hot dark matter, although there's lots of constraints on that. And importantly, you can get axion photon scattering in the presence of astrophysical magnetic fields. And there's been a growing literature about possible radio signatures of this. So I just want to remind everyone that even though I ostensibly this talk is about dark matter, that actually axions are really interesting outside of dark matter. And um, that's why that's why it's it's such an exciting uh, perspective particle to work on. And so of course, um, just to be very clear, the axion is hypothesized. We still haven't detected it. So how do we find them? The, the classic way that people have gone looking for axions is axions converting into detectable photons in the presence of a strong magnetic field. So there are an ever-growing number of experiments that are now using this effect or something like it. And the, I would say like the OG experiment is, the, is ADMX, the axion dark matter experiment at the University of Washington, which has, I think, an eight Tesla magnetic field inside a microwave cavity. And the hope is that an axion flies through it, interacts with the magnetic field and converts into photons. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of this plot is uh, what, what ADMX projected for their Gen 2 um, sensitivity. I know that um, it's probably been updated by this point. Um, one of the things to note about this particular plot is actually in the case of the QCD axion, the mass and the coupling are not independent of one another, whereas for an ELP, they potentially can be. And so that's, for example, one difference between the QCD axion and an ELP. Um, I also want to point out, so you might have noticed on the last slide that there are some astrophysical constraints. I just want to point out, um, so this was the, this plot is taken from a white paper that uh, a few of us submitted to the Astro 2020 Decadal last year. The archive number is here. That there are lots of different ways to constrain um, ultralight axions using astrophysical phenomena. So using the SKA telescope, Lyman Alpha, cosmic microwave background radiation. And what you'll see here on the right, the BHSR is black hole super radiance, which is a, a really exciting thing to think about, especially since we now know that there are lots of stellar or more stellar mass black holes out there than we expected. I'm, I also wanna point out that I think that high energy astrophysics has a lot to say here. Um, we can place constraints because of axion photon oscillations over long distances, um, either because of um, neutrino oscillations or also traveling through like extra galactic magnetic fields. So here is a, a plot um, that was produced by a team that I lead for um, NASA's Strobex. This is a proposed X-ray spectroscopy and timing space telescope. So my team is called Team Strobax. And this shows how different X-ray and gamma ray experiments are placing constraints on axions. So you'll see on the bottom of the plot, the mass, and the vertical part of the plot is the coupling constant. And you can see that I'm. Um, Strobex can place constraints in, in one particular region, and it will actually be nice to work with Chandra data and Strobex data together when um, Strobex gets approved. I'm being optimistic. I haven't been told it's going to be approved, but I'm being optimistic. Um, so I just want to point out, so like what makes axions like phenomenologically distinct? So there are really like two different categories of dark matter we can think about. So traditionally, and probably if you've heard other dark matter talks this summer, you've heard about WIMPs. 
So WIMPs tend to be fermions. So just as a reminder for everybody in the audience, fermions are stacking particles. When they get to really cool temperatures, they will go into the lowest possible energy level available to them, but they cannot all share the same state. Whereas um, bosons, scalar particles like the axion can actually, once you get below a critical temperature, all start to share the same state. And this leads to a phenomenon that we call the Bose-Einstein condensate state. And this is something that we've observed in atomic physics that we know has, can actually happen in the laboratory. And it's worth noting that before these were first created in the laboratory, the common belief from the theory side was that Bose-Einstein condensates could only be stably created um, when the atoms had an effective positive scattering length when they had a repulsive self-interaction and when they had a negative scattering length or an attractive self-interaction that they could not be stable. It turned out that this was not true. They were able to show this with lithium-7 just a few years after the rubidium-87 experiments and this is going to become relevant in a second. So the equation of evolution that we use to describe axions and cosmological scales takes the following form. If you were to put your hand over, and this is what I would do if I was in person, over the gravitational interaction and even the self-interaction that I labeled on here, you would recognize this equation as the Schrodinger equation. When you include the self-interaction, um, this can look like what is called in atomic physics the gross pitayevsky equation. And that equation is what is used to describe a Bose-Einstein condensate in atomic physics. So in the case of the axion, we now also on cosmological scales have these gravitational interactions. So this nonlinear Schrodinger equation, or some, what is sometimes called um, the Schrodinger-Poisson system, has interesting crossover phenomena that we discuss in atomic physics, except here we're talking about a scalar particle on large cosmological scales. So for many years, people have been talking about um, the creation of Bose-Einstein condensates in space, and specifically can axions or other scalar particles form BECs. There was a very interesting proposal by Pierre Sakivi who was one of the earliest theorists of axion cosmology and one of his students, um, that they proposed that QCD axions would form Bose-Einstein condensates during the radiation-dominated era in the very early universe. And, that, um, and so they, they centered their thinking about how this would happen around masses of 10 to the minus 5 eV, which for people who don't tend to think in electron volts is about 10 to the minus 44 kilograms. And their motivation for this was that there is a, an extremely high occupation number, that we expect a very high occupation number for um, the cosmological population that's formed um, in the symmetry breaking processes in the early universe. And that because of this high occupation number, that the temperature would be sufficiently low for the axion to remain coherent. I actually have a student right now who is working on doing the exact calculation of what the critical temperature should be. Um, there were a couple of interesting claims in their paper, which is that the Bose-Einstein condensate would form through gravitational thermalization, not through the fight of the four self-interactions, which is different from what we see in the lab, and that the correlation length for the, the condensate would be the Hubble scale during the radiation-dominated era, and that this would translate at later times, um, at low redshifts, like closer to the present, into having uh, regions of high density in galaxies, so we would have ring-like caustics instead of what we traditionally expect from WIMPs to have spherical caustics. So there's a very nice paper by Ed Birchinger from the 1980s about um, how WIMPs would form spherical caustics. So this is a very different phenomenology. And, and just to give folks a sense of scale, this plot shows um, a ring that's tens of kiloparsecs across. So this is basically like a galaxy-sized caustic that rings um, the, the, the visible matter, the baryons inside a galaxy. Um, so a few years ago, I wrote a paper with Alan Guth and Mark Hertzberg where we asked the question, does elf dark matter form Bose-Einstein condensates? Because we were sort of intrigued by some of these claims. So when 
I, yes, we agree that Bose-Einstein condensates should form. For the QCD axion, though, we found a very different answer from Sakibi's team, that we found that it should be with small locally correlated solitons. So these um, are sometimes called in the literature Bose stars. Anna Watts, my colleague, has been calling them asteroids, which is very appropriate for 10 to the minus 5 EV. It's going to be about 20 times the mass of Ceres, so it's really going to be asteroid sized. For ultralight axions, these, um, and this translates because of the de Broglie wavelength associated with the field to halos with solitons at their core, but really galaxy sized halos. And the other important thing we pointed out in this paper is that the sign of the interaction determines the coherence length and um, the soliton size. So you remember I said that people thought attractive self interactions couldn't lead to a stable Bose-Einstein condensate being formed. It turned out that they can be stable, but you can't put too many particles into it or it will decohere and it will destabilize. So even if you have something that's virialized, you have a clump that's self-gravitating, it won't necessarily be coherent where everything is in the same um, momentum ground state. So I just wanted to point out this very nice simulation um, by Ishua and, and his team um, that sometimes these large scale halo, um, like 10 to the minus 20 EV-ish, um, are referred to as fuzzy dark matter. So if you've seen that in the literature, that's what that is. Um, so one of the debates that's kind of ongoing is whether we are treating these Bose-Einstein condensates um, and these axions correctly if they're classical. Um, and for example, there's a nice paper by Levkov et al. in 2018 that argued that axions evolving under their self-gravity um, cannot be described as a standard Boltzmann collision process. And so I actually just put out a paper with um, Tony Mirasola, who's my student, please remember his name, and mathematician uh, Kay Kirkpatrick, um, that a high occupancy number um, means that axions can't be localized to a definite position in, in, in momentum. In, momentum space. So um, you really can't think about this as a standard Boltzmann process of particles colliding with each other. And so we've actually been doing some work um, proposing that you actually need to use a Wigner formalism. The archive number for our paper, which is now under review at PRD, is available at the bottom right hand side of the screen. One of the things that we were interested in is understanding what the rate of condensation into these Bose stars were um, if you include gravity and if you only include the self interactions. And what we found was that there are wildly different time scales and that Sakibi was right. Um, you cannot get thermalization into a coherent momentum state without gravity, at least on the time scale of the age of our universe. So you need 10 to the 22 seconds, which is way too many seconds. We don't have that many seconds yet. Um, it's important, though, to point out that they can still be impactful for the evolution of the system. So what I'm showing you on this slide now is um, preliminary results from forthcoming work with my student Noah Glennon, another name to keep an eye out for. And so what you're looking at on the left is a soliton orbiting a central potential. And you're looking at the difference of what happens to the, um, the tidal stripping of the soliton when at the top there's no self interaction and just gravity, the middle where there's an attractive self interaction, and the bottom where there's a repulsive self interaction. And so you can actually see that the time scale for tidal stripping is going to be different depending on what, whether the self interaction is accounted for and what the sign is. Um, and then just quickly, I'll point out, so the, the two columns in the middle are two solitons interacting with each other with no self-interaction. And on the right, you have two solitons with a self, an attractive self-interaction. So you can actually see that accounting for the self-interaction is important. I'm emphasizing this because a lot of people have been ignoring the self-interactions in the literature, and it's been kind of my mission to highlight why we shouldn't do that. Um, so I'm reaching at the end of my time. These colloquia are on the shorter side. Um, axions are worth your attention. The phenomenology of axion dark matter, I think is really exciting for observational cosmology and astrophysics and really across the entire astrophysical spectrum. So from radio all the way up to gamma ray. 
And I just want to point out there's a larger context in which I'm, I'm giving this talk and I'm in which some of the people who are doing this work are doing this work. Um, so I just want to point out that police killings and um, the visibility of police killings really negatively affects the mental health of Black Americans. Um, the mental health burden of police killings is equivalent to the burden associated with diabetes. And this is a study from The Lancet just from 2018, and they actually think that they underestimated the impact that it can have. And so I just want to point out that institutions doing business as usual um, is ableist. I'm um, pressuring people to do business as usual is ableist because people are actually experiencing real health impacts. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that um, people who are Black and living in Aspen have been speaking out about the challenges that they are facing. So um, Sam Harvey owns a gallery that maybe several of us have been into during our wonderful visits at the Aspen Center for Physics. He gets called the N-word. He has people violating his bodily space by touching his hair. People have physically attacked him. Um, with water balloons, and he has overheard people saying that what they like about Aspen is that there aren't Black people there. So I just want to point out that um, what's happening socially now impacts all of us. It impacts me as, as a Black American. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chanda, for a really nice talk um, and for such a powerful message at the end. We can now open up for questions. So I'll ask if you have a question to use the, the raise hand feature in Zoom. Um, it should be in the, the chat box. Um, and so if you, or you can type it into the, into the chat. Uh, maybe I will t abuse my power a bit and ask the first question. Um, so Chanda, you, you talked about the self interactions, and I think you, you mentioned this as well. Phenomenologically, can you tell the difference between um, attractive and repulsive? interactions like in your simulations do you notice a phenomenological difference between the two yeah let me see if i can figure out how to get back to you yay okay that's like that's working for me um so i i guess i would point to um your two pairs of columns so the ones on the right and the ones in the middle here um, so as you can see the there's actually a merger occurring with the attractive self interacting soliton that we don't actually see in the case of the the new self interaction soliton and so i i think the 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 jury is kind of out in terms of you know when we start to put so these simulations by the way so these are simulations that are done with pi psi ultralight which is a modified ultra late scalar code that was developed by Richard Easter and his team at the University of Auckland. It's a hyper idealized simulation, right? So there's no baryons in it. Um, we haven't, for example, there isn't even an, an NFW potential here. I'm, I'm now working with um, Ethan Nadler and Arka Banerjee and Risa Wexler, along with NOAA at Stanford, where we are, are, are starting to think about, about some of these things and we've started to run some simulations relating to this. So this is like a very idealized um, simulation, but it really indicates to us that there is a long-term, there's a potential long-term impact of thinking of including the self interactions. And so the one thing I don't show you on the slide, we've, of course, Noah and I have this paper prepared, it will probably go up on the archive in about two weeks. We also show what happens when you include the repulsive self interactions, and you do get different phenomenologies, at least in on, on the time scales that we've been looking at. So I think it's it's very suggestive. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's really interesting. And also, for those of you who aren't aware, um, the raise hand feature is in the participants list. So if you hit participants, you'll see it. Um, so, so I guess I sorry, I just want to add something. <laughs> yeah, <good. laughs> I guess the thing that so I jumped to talking about the phenomenology. So these solitons, these are like the halo scale, ten to the minus twenty one eV um, particles that I'm I'm showing you. On, on the slide, so, but it's worth also pointing out that for the 10 to the minus five EV, um, the, the Schrodinger, the nonlinear Schrodinger Poisson system has a scaling relation in it. So you might expect that the phenomenology is basically going to be the same, but that it will just happen at different size scales. But of course in cosmology, this is actually really meaningful because your initial conditions on different scales are going to be different. So you actually start with different initial conditions 
we face a challenge in trying to understand what the, the um, long-term evolution is of something that is higher mass, like 10 to the minus 5 EV, because they form smaller objects. And it's actually really hard to simulate something on that mass scale, even in n-body simulations. So I think that that's a really important thing, that one of the reasons people go to these um, large scale structure um, to, to thinking about these 10 to the minus 20 EV um, ultralight fuzzy dark matter halos is that they're simply easier to study in some sense. I see. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, okay, so the first hand I saw was Sam, Sam McDermott. If you want to go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks, Indian. Uh, thanks, Chanda. Uh, I'll turn on my video. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so I also had a question about uh, this slide uh, for the uh, evolution of the the solitons is the how do you model the host halo? Are you modeling that with with the dense solitonic core, and is that uh, a time independent? Is it is that like fixed, or is that back reacting to the simulation? Yeah, so I guess this is good. You're also asking me like the things that kind of get to the limits of what we're doing, right? So I would think about like pi psi ultralight as the code that gives you indicators of where you want to go with your more detailed code. Um, so, uh, in fact, Richard and maybe Jens Niemeyer also, uh, and, and their, both of their research groups have just put out a, an, the axionics code that will do some things that, that don't happen here. So in this particular case, there's simply, like, there's a central potential. Um, it's, it's super highly idealized. And um, so that's one thing, which I said already, I guess. And then the second thing is, is that the soliton is seated. So we have not evolved the soliton naturally, but we start with a soliton and then watch it um, evolve after the soliton has already, has already been formed. Like we assume that the formation happens before the code turns on. So in, in terms of thinking about like what, is, um, what are these, these time scales, that, that, that's something that's important. Um, and I guess like the comment that I would make in relation to that is, oh, I. I don't know how to make this work. So I'm gonna give up and not show the previous slide. But the, the um, paper that I just put out with my student, Tony Mirasola, and with Kay Kirkpatrick was actually getting to this question of what, is, what are the timescales for the actual soliton formation process? So if you have something like what is called like an axion mini cluster, which is just like basically a virialized but not necessarily coherent um, clump of axions, how do we describe the actual condensation into something where there's a coherent momentum state? So I think that that, that goes to, to the other piece of your question, which is making sure when we put that into the code, it turns out that maybe the best way to do that is not with a Boltzmann formalism, which is what has been like the popular formalism in the literature, but actually I'm using this Wigner formalism that I think uh, Tony did a really good job of um, leading us in, in, in developing. But that was a question that begged me for a really long time is are we using the right formalism? And when we make, we've done lots of like these, these hand waving arguments for why phi to the four is not as significant as gravity. But I would like to actually see that analytically shown. And our paper, I think, was really the first one to show analytically that, um, which time scales matter for the formation process. So to kind of tie this back to your question, Sam, when you're thinking about the time scales, it really matters what stage of the process you're talking about as to what um, needs to be emphasized and what's significant and, and what's not. I think okay, so. I'm, I, I don't know, I, in terms of like time, maybe we have time yeah. for one more question, Tian Tian. Um, yeah, so actually let's have two, two more questions. Okay. So maybe the next hand is Mordecai, Mark, Mark Hi, okay, so have, um, I was wondering if you could go over the uh, experimental limits slide that you had uh, showing you know, the different experiments. It was a little unclear which experiments, like the uh, UW experiment was a strike down. Is that the included region, the excluded region? So let me see if I can figure out how to um, Get back actually, to that slide. oh yeah, so I have to stop sharing and then it will yeah. let me go back, but it won't let me go back without stopping sharing. Okay, so you're asking, for example, that about one. this ADMX slide. 
Yeah. Okay, so I'm, and also, yeah, that was the one. And then there was the next slide as well. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm essentially, maybe this doesn't answer your question. I'm one of, one of the questions, one of the, the things that are, is not immediately obvious when you're talking about these experiments is that actually tuning the cavity is really difficult. And so mm -hmm. you might be looking at this and going, well, why are they moving so slowly through this parameter space? Um, this is actually really hard to, to tune the cavity. Um, if you talk to like Gray Ribka uh, about this, he's, he's the co-PI on the ADMX experiment. It's actually, if you ever go to University of Washington, get him to give you a tour. It's like super fun. Um, so part of it is getting things cold enough so that you don't have noise and so that you know your photons are actually your decay signature and not um, photons for, for some other reason. So I don't know if that, that gets to your question, but that's, that's part of what's, what's happening with this experiment um, is that you actually can't do a large parameter space all at once. Okay, so I guess what you're saying is that low mass axions have been ruled out by this experiment, but high mass axions are still a technical challenge. Yeah, so I would say um, like low mass axions that um, are governed by, Q by the QCD formulation, right? Once you decouple your axion mass and your axion couple, your um, G A gamma gamma coupling constant, you can be a lot more creative. And this is why I, call, I kind of called it like a DIY I mean, you all know how we theor theoretical physicists are, right? Like we're very DIY. If, if um, we can break a, a nice particle and make it do something else, we will. And so in some sense, um, you can then think of it as that the, there's then an entire class. Oh, okay. And so to go on to the next one, there is then an entire class of particles, right? Um, and so actually maybe this doesn't show nicely on this plot. So this is the other one. I yeah. think I think that this plot that Team Strobax made, and I should say Manuel Meyer, um, who I, I think is on the faculty market this year, I'll just point that out. Um, that here you're seeing blocks, right? And in this particular plot, we are no longer assuming that it's the QCD axion. So this mm. is constraints on axion-like particles. So that's, if you were wondering about what's the difference between like, why does this plot, if that was the question, that that's why. That, that is that was, here we're assuming the, ELPS. Yeah. The question was bigger, but this is definitely helping. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna ask two questions that are coming from the chat that are kind of more axion theory related. So one is from Aaron Chow, who's asking, um, why does high occupation number make a difference when claiming that the axion wave cannot be precisely localized in phase space. Isn't this true in general because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? And then the second question was from Lawrence Krauss and was asking um, why you are interested in self-interactions for the axion, in particular because the self-interactions from the axion potential tend to be very small, much smaller than gravity. Yeah, okay, so I probably, yeah. Okay, so to, to the first question, it matters if you're thinking about using the Boltzmann formalism. So I think that this is the main thing, which is I'm um, to go to 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 go really to the heart of it. And I, I probably could have said this more clearly during the talk. Um, the Boltzmann formalism is really there to describe the interactions of particles, but you're right that this is really a wave situation. And so really the question that we're asking ourselves here is, is this the appropriate way to describe the dynamics of a classical wave? Um, and I, actually there was something that I'll just like add on to that, which I, I forgot to say earlier, which is that, for example, Pierre Sakivi would dispute this. And there's actually even a very nice paper by Mark Hertzberg and one of his students that just came out a couple of months ago that indicates that there probably actually should be some quantum effects taken into account. Um, this is something that for a long time I thought Yes, there is a classical solution, but also there are probably some quantum effects that should be taken into account. So the question of I'm considering the self-interaction, um, again, it depends on whether you're talking about the QCD axion or whether you're talking about something more general. 
um, there are still self, the self interactions that are in the simulations that NOAA has been doing are still experimentally viable self interactions. And we're still seeing that the self interaction actually makes a meaningful difference in the phenomenology. So I was interested partly because I wanted to know the answer to that question of whether the self interactions mattered, even if they are sometimes small. And the answer, um, the answer seems to be yes, that they could potentially be meaningful. Um, and, and we're not the only ones who are finding that. There are some nice papers by Pierre-Henri Chavanis that actually we used his papers as a baseline for is our code working correctly by basically checking to see whether we got results that were similar to his. And so Amanda has told me that we can take a few more questions. Um, and so maybe one logistical question that Amanda can answer is, how can we see the seminar um, or access the recording of the seminar? Um, so on our YouTube channel, uh, there's a link at the bottom of the email that we sent to everybody to our YouTube. And you can also just type Aspen Physics into YouTube and you'll see all of our previous recordings. And this one will be available this afternoon. Okay, so given, yeah, given Amanda's uh, Permission. Let's take a few more questions. So the next hand I see is from Justin Miles. Hi, Justin. Hi. So I was wondering if, if you could say more about how to understand what features in Axion determine the geometry of the caustics it causes in structure. I'm. Um, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have like a really good excuse for that. So my excuse for that is actually like, I don't agree with the Sukibi and Yang claim and, and that team's claim that you will get um, the ring like caustics. And I haven't seen a paper that compellingly convinces me of that either. So I, 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 I've really kind of struggled, struggled to follow the thought process behind it. I like the idea though, and so I don't want to say like it's impossible and nobody should ever think about it, but I think it's something that people need to kind of keep hammering at. Um, it would really make a difference though if it's a ring like versus like something that's spherical, right? And so there, there is a paper that um, I think Sakibi put out a few years ago, and I just want to actually put this out there for the astrophysicists because I think it should be checked. But there was a claim that if you assume that there is a ring like caustic, that this actually um, can be seen in measurements of rotation curves. And I'm not sure that, um, so this has been checked. And in fact, I usually have a slide about this and I don't. Julie Dumas, who is now a professor of physics at Xavier University in Louisiana, um, did her dissertation starting to check some of these claims about the, the caustics and, and and the rings and the rotation curves. So that would be the place to go look, is to look at that paper and look at citations of it to see if anybody's followed up on it. My recollection of this, and it's been a little while since I thought about it, is that like it would be nice to see what she did with a larger data set, and I don't know if she has since done that, but that would be the thing that I would wanna see. Even if, I guess like that doesn't answer the question about the theory though, which is like, can you get the ring? I don't know, but if someone can actually compellingly convince me that there is good evidence that there is a ring out there, then of course, I'm much more interested in reverse engineering. How do we get there? Awesome, thank you. The next question is from Paul, Paul Frampton. You're still there. Uh, yes, um, Chandler, could you show again the slide very near the beginning where you had many dark matter candidates? Yes, let me just pause share so I can go back. <laughs> Is this the Venn diagram? I'm very competitive about this Venn diagram. <laughs> well, some of us uh, are considering seriously uh, the primordial intermediate mass black hole. As uh, I'm glad you asked about this. Which is uh, probably between 50 and 100 orders of magnitude more massive than an axion. And I just wondered where it is on this diagram. Yeah, so, okay, so don't blame, don't blame Tim entirely for this, because in fact, um, 
this I will advertise that my book that's going to come out on March 9th, which you can pre-order already. So if you just punch my name into your favorite bookstore website, you can buy it. Um, a version of this Venn diagram is going in the book and I made Tim add black holes to it. So um, the, I am the the question of like, where would I where would I put primordial black holes on on this? And I don't know. It, it kind of like like if I was if I was adding it like it's not a, well, let me be careful what I say. I was going to say it's not a particle based dark matter, right? Except of course, black holes are usually made out of stuff initially. But even in the case of like primordial black holes, for example, like Alan has been thinking for years about how you might produce primordial black holes at the end of inflation. I wouldn't necessarily say that those were, were made out of like normal matter in the way that we might expect maybe I'm um, something that is the product of a collapse process to you to have formed. So I don't really know. I mean, it may be that this Venn diagram actually needs like a third, like needs to come out of the page so that we can start thinking about um, topological space time candidates. Like I would just class it differently. Um, but I'm open to arguments for why I'm thinking about it wrong. Well, it does say theories of dark matter, doesn't it? Yeah, so I mean, maybe if really it needs to be like, I, it needs a higher dimension, might be the way to solve this well, problem. There is a space where you have written a series of dark matter where it could go, I would think. Yeah, I mean, maybe in the middle, that, that might be, I, I guess the, the problem is, it doesn't necessarily cross over with the, with the other, I mean, there is, I guess I should say, because there, like, there's the soliton dark matter, and also, which is separate from these axion, like particles that we tend to think about. Um, there was a paper recently that claimed from April, and the names of the authors is escaping me, that claimed that um, solitons at the center of galaxies could mimic supermassive black holes. Um, so you could think maybe in terms of analogies that maybe it belongs with some crossover with the soliton dark matter. That might be my temptation if I was then diagramming it. Okay, so maybe in light of the, the time, take one more question. So I saw Shada's hand on. Hi, Chanda, thank you very much for the great talk. And also uh, thank you for like pointing out the social issues that are happening right now in, um, in the world as well. I really appreciated that. Uh, so my question is from more like a model building aspect, I guess. So QCD axion is, um, you know, great because it solves two problems at a time. But how should I think about the axion-like particles, like, like the motivation behind them? Just another um, you know, VSM model, or are they still like more beautiful than others, in your opinion? Um I mean, I have to say, and, and I hope my PhD advisor, Lee Smolin, is not on, on the call because he might be unhappy with me for saying this, but I think that like the motivation from string theory for the ultralight axions is like a very nice motivation um, because we really do see these moduli that are basically light particles with shift symmetries. They just fall out of string theory really naturally. And so I'm... Um, what makes the QCD axion enduring and kind of its attractiveness and popularity, I think, is because it does solve the, this problem that we genuinely have in the standard model. Like, we need the QCD axion or we need something that does the same thing that the Petchy Quinn mechanism does, right? Um, but from the point of view of string theory, I think that, or from the point of view of just solving the dark matter problem, I think that I'm... Um, you know, the string theory motivation is, 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 is a nice motivation. But again, it's, it's, it's difficult to top the fact that the QCD axion comes out of a, the most popular and so far best solution to a real problem that we know that we have with the standard model, which for the most part is complete and very well tested. Um, whereas string theory, totally worth studying. So let me be clear about that. But also... Um, is not well tested, right? There is less of a case for like string theory is definitely the thing that we know we need to be spending time on. Whereas with the standard model, we know we need to solve problems with it because we know it's real. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks Chanda for, um, 
for giving this really nice talk and thanks for all the questions. Sorry we didn't have time to, to take all of them. Um, so if you have any other questions, I suggest maybe getting in touch with Chanda um, herself. And um, like Amanda said, you can find a recording of this talk on YouTube. And with that, I guess we wrap up the 2020 summer season of Aspen Colloquial. And I just want to say thank you to TNTN for stepping in at the last minute to host and to Amanda for taking care of things on the on the Aspen side of things. Yeah, so applause, <laughs> applause all around. Thank you so much.